Hey, Ella here. How's it going? Just got a bit more information I'd like to share with you. We got Adelaide. It's the city of churches. Okay. Um, Adelaide is the first Australian city that wasn't a penal, you know, like convict settlement. Um, and a lot of, at the moment, there's a lot of destruction going on. Adelaide, the city of churches, was firstly and foremostly a Christian state established by Christians, the free proclamation of the gospel to all who lived here. In 1834, the British Parliament enacted the Self Australian Colonisation Act, which authorised the settlement of free colonies in South Australia, including some territory which previously formed part of New South Wales. South Australia was finally settled as a Christian colony. The settlement of South Australia was unique in that it was only a state. It was, it was the only state that was settled by a group of Christians, dissenters, not aligned with the Church of England. The state of South Australia was primarily settled by such Christians, and it's a good example of the spirit that motivated, motivated many early settlers. The establishment of Australia was also distinct in the inhabitants were all free settlers. No convicts were <coughs> permitted. The Christian colonisation of South Australia was another example of a root and spirit that motivated many of the Australian early settlers in its capital, Adelaide. It is known as the City of Churches and is renowned for its orderly layout. One of the most important people in the foundation of South Australia was George Fife Angus. Angus Street was named after him. He said, my great object was to provide a place of refuge for prior dissenters of the Great Britain who could in their new home discharge their consciences before God in civil and religious duties, that South Australia will become the headquarters for a diffusion of Christianity in the Southern Hemisphere. George Fife Angus, God's hand in the foundation of South Australia is demonstrated by the fact that within 10 years, over half the population of the state were attending two denominal churches further church buildings were necessary. From its settlement in 1836 to 1956, 1915, Sunday school enrolments exceeded those of day school. The state of South Australia was like many parts of Australia colonised by Lutherans. Lutherans and are like a group of Lutherans who had been badly prosecuted, prosecuted in Prussia arrived in 1839. George Angus had been deeply moved by the plight of these German Christians at the considerable financial risk of himself, eventually financed all the ships to make the voyage. One example of this was on the 28th of July, 1838, the immigrants came from aboard the Zebra, bound for South Australia, 199 souls in number. They had to immigrate from Prussia because of their faith, and were indeed very religious. There was an address as well as prayers and hymns every morning and evening, participated in by all on board the ship. The sound of their beautiful singing can be heard across the harbour, one witness said. Everyone who heard them testified that their rare gift for song. Captain Hahn was so impressed by his passengers, he apparently felt some beauty to see them safely settled in their land before he sailed away and personally supervised the purchase of their land. On the 24th of January 1835, Captain Hahn and his party journeyed into the Sir Adelaide Hills to see land near Mount Baker, offered by Mr. Dutton, a wealthy landholder. The captain was very pleased and personally helped in the drawing up of the land contracts. The town of Handroff was named after Captain Hahn of the Zebra. Handroff is the oldest surviving German settlement in Australia. A plaque commemorating Captain Doc Hamilton was unveiled on the 15th of August 1982. Um, the Adelaide City of Churches now using many of these church buildings outside their purpose that they originally built for and dedicated for the worship of God. The city's oldest buildings of churches, in particular the Holy Trinity Church on the North Terrace, built in 1838, and the Queen Quaker Meeting House in Pennington Terrace, built in 1840. The spires of the towers of such churches, such as St. Peter's Cathedral, Bourne Place, the United Church, and Scots Church, are still prominent in the city skyline today. Fortunately, some remain in use for the purpose that they were built for and dedicated, yet some churches have become restaurants, bars, pubs, and in some cases lay abandoned. 
quite a travesty there is that there are enough, not enough believers in the city of Adelaide to populate and retain these sites that were dedicated to the worship of God and teaching of the scriptures. Yet many of the churches at a larger scale met in much larger, more contemporary buildings. We know and gave God glory for, but not to also to keep these buildings for the purpose they were built and dedicated to seems wrong. I wonder what our Christian forefathers would have said about the church this occurring. We also acknowledge that the church is a people and not a building, yet many churches meet in Adelaide and have no building of their own to meet in. Okay, so it's it's pretty um unique that um you know, these churches the oldest one is the Holy Trinity built in um eighteen thirty eight. This storyline just doesn't seem to be <coughs> fitting with the rest of the, the story. So Okay. Um So, Foundling Orphanage. <coughs> this is in Adelaide. And they seem to have the, you know, like the design of a, of a sort of a Tartaria. You've got the Antiquitech device up here. I don't know if it's in there or if it's missing. Lots of aerials on top of it. Buildings like that. So. Here's another Adelaide picture. I just wanted to show you. Um, it's really strange that we've got one spire here with a circle. It goes down. And we've got another one over here, a spire with a circle. And another one over here with a circle. So basically within a block, we seem to have three clock towers. And I don't believe they were clock towers. I believe there was some sort of device that um, transmitted her. Air, um, electricity, transmitted electricity. So, this is another one of our laid. Um, it, it, it's mud flooded, all the buildings are so mud flooded. You can see quite clearly. This is another one of um, Adelaide, the crematorium. I just wanted to show you, you, you know, yet again, we've got a, like a church design building as, as a crematorium. So, they seem to have repurposed all the building, there would be government departments, hospitals, all kinds of things like that. Now, the hospital, the children's hospital, has um, tunnels that actually link up underneath it. That not many people know about today that are still there. A lot of them link up to all the old pubs and town hall, all the bond stores, all those kinds of things. So according to the street directory from 2008, there were 749 churches in Adelaide that year. Okay, I just thought I'd show you quickly how many yellow pages we have for churches and it's got several pages. We've got lots of churches. And something like 56% um, of the population is still Christian. Close that one off. Okay. Adelaide is the capital city of the state of South Australia. It is the fifth most populous city of Australia. And um, Adelaide is situated on the Adelaide Plains, north of the Furu Peninsula, between the Gulf St. Vincent in the west and Mount Lofty Ranges in the east. Its metropolitan area exceeds 20 kilometres, 12 miles from the coast to the foothills, and stretches 96 kilometres, 60 miles from Brawla in the north to Skillix Beach in the south. Named in honour of Queen Adelaide, consort to the King William, the city was founded in 1836 and as the planned capital for the freely settled British province in Australia. Colonel William Light, one of Australia's founding fathers, designed the city centre and chose the location to post to the group of Torrens. In an area additionally, originally inhabited by the Karangwa people. Now, they had something like 25,000 Aboriginals living in the area back then, so, um, 
That's a lot of people. Um, it was known in the place of the red kangaroo. Light's decision, now listed as National Heritage, set out the city to be named a grid layout. Of course, the grid layout is in almost every city worldwide. Wide boulevards, large public squares, and highly surrounded by parkways. Early colonial Adelaide was shaped by the diversity and the wealth of its free settlers, in contrast to the convict history and the other Australian histories. Until the post-war era, it was Australia's third largest city, and had been noted for its leading examples of religious freedom and progressive. It became known as the City of Churches due to the diversity of faiths. Today, Adelaide is noted for many festivals and sporting events, food and wine, its commerce and manufacturing sectors, Adelaide quality of life. Sorry about that, I don't know why it's doing that. Within the European settlement, have pretty much out to Nata. Sorry, um, the Aboriginal people have got a thing to you, I said that wrong. So, yeah, they pretty much slaughtered them. So, proclaim. In uh, December 23, 1836, near the old gum tree suburb of Glen North. The event is commemoration day. The site of the Clonidley's capital was laid out by Colonel William Blight, Mayor General of South Australia. There were designs made by architect George Strickland. Kingston, the city was named after Adelaide of Saxe Ming Mahing, Queen Consort to the Queen. Adelaide was established as a penal colony of free immigrant, promising civil liberties, freedoms from religious persecutions based upon the ideas that Edward given Wakefield. Wakefield had read accounts in the, of an Australian settlement while in prison in London for an attempting to abduct a heiress, and realised that the colony suffered from a lack of available labour due to the practice of giving land grants to all. The idea was for the government to survive all the land at all that would be enough to be unaffordable for us and journeyman, free something like that and just keep the poor poorer. Don't let them get up. Don't give them a leg up in life. Um, so Adelaide doesn't share the convict settlement here, like um, Sydney, Sydney and Hobart. It was believed that the in the colony of free be little, little crime, no provisions made for a, a goal in Colonel Seven plan, but mid, by mid 1837, the South Australian was warning of escaped convicts from New South Wales and tenders for a temporary goal was sought. Following a murder and attempted murders in Adelaide during March 1838, Governor Hindmesh created the South Australian Police Force and in April 1838, under 21-year-old Henry Moon, the first Sheriff Samuel Smart was found wounded during a robbery and on the 2nd of May 1836, one of the offenders, Michael Madge, became the first person to be hanged in South Australia. William Baker Ashton was appointed the governor of the temporary goal in 1839, and then George Strickland Kingston was commissioned the new Adelaide goal. Now, the Adelaide goal actually cost about 30000 to build, which is roughly the same cost it cost to build the town hall. Most of these buildings cost 30000 to build. So it is very interesting to try and piece this. I hope we can work together and... Um, all share our ideas and help each other and bring this information out into the light. Um, they did go through a depression after it um, started. So this is the Adelaide goal. We call them goals here in Australia. Same as the British goal, like a soccer goal or a football goal. Um, we, the, the jail is called the um, watch house. It's sort of where the police hold you overnight. So our jails are not like the jails in America or overseas. Okay, Adelaide Gold was a prison located in the parklands of Adelaide in the south state of Australia. The Gold was the first permanent one in South Australia and operated from 1841 to 1988. The Gold is one of the two oldest buildings still standing in South Australia, the other being Government House which was built at the same time. The prison is now a museum to tourist attraction and a function centre. When the first colonials arrived at South Australia in late 1836, any prisoners that were there, there were a few at first, were held in irons aboard the ships of HMS Buffalo. And then Tam O'Shanter in early 1837 in the public were warned 
Escaped convicts from New South Wales may reach the colony in a mid 1937 Buffalo and Tim Shanders sailed away, recognising the need tenders had already been called for a temporary goal. Meanwhile, the Governor's Guard Royal Marines held prisoners in their encampment in the present botanic chain to a tree. Oh, so you may. So you may. And they usually had the prisoners in the box of the ships. Now this botanic gardens is um made of three mil thick glass. It was all transported over from England in a flat pack. It was really interesting. Pause it for a second. As the population expanded, a temporary lockup became necessary, which was built in eighteen thirty eight near Government House, Adelaide. And then a mere hut, so the Marines could guard both the prisoners and Governor John Hindmarsh. There was also a wooden slab affair with timber palisade fences, although one room was freestone, which became known as the Stone Jug. It was located at the northeast corner of the present Government House domain. In 1836, the first Sheriff Samuel, Sheriff Samuel Smart was wounded during a robbery. And that led to one of the offenders, Michael Mouch, becoming the first person to be hanged in South Australia on the 2nd of May, 1838. When Governor Hyde Marsh left, he also took all of his Marines, so all the South Australian police then ran temporary goal until the Adelaide one was built. Long-term prisoners were sentenced to transportation to the Eastern Penal Colony, so which that would have been Norfolk Island or Port Arthur. Escorted there by police on intercoastal ships. Even so, the goal was overcrowded, sometimes holding up to 70 prisoners. Parts of the coals had become so dilapidated that if it not had been for the building behind, it would have collapsed. It would have collapsed. So, how long was it standing there? They've just come in and moved in. On July 1838, it was reported that the prisoners easily escaped because the walls were rotten and there were gaps in the foundation. So if this building was only a couple of years old, six, seven, eight, six, thirty-seven, so one year, within one year, so we got early eighteen thirty-eight. The public were warned about the um, escaped convicts, and then um, down here it's saying it would have collapsed in July eighteen thirty-eight. So that's just what twelve months later. It just doesn't make sense. So to me it sounds like the buildings were there, there was a disaster and everyone moved in afterwards. They found the land and um, had too much population in England and famines and fighting on with the other countries over land and food and wealth and whatnot that um, they had to seek out new lands. So although um, Governor Grawler was under oath from the secret committee of the South Australian to, in Britain to not undertake any public works. In 1840, George Strickland Kingston was commissioner to design a permanent goal to hold 140 prisoners. The plans were based on England's principal prison. So it's pretty much like a copy. Proceedings of the selected committee indicate that Britain, nothing, nothing was known of the goal's construction and there is no record or any mention in the official databases dispatches from South Australia. So, how convenient, just no records, no records at all. The original estimate for the construction was £17,000. However, in late July 1840, one month after construction began, the plans were altered by Governor George Gawler, and although the foundations had been laid, new plans halved the building work, which effectively reduced the contract cost to £10,000. Although this did not include the cost of the work already completed in October, Grawler then again altered the plans by now including the Golders house and he had earlier dropped out from the original plans and added two more towers and increased the quality of the stonework. So these new alterations added £9,000 to the cost and by March 1841 the goal was nearing completion. The builders borrow on the Goody, Goody Art had already received £10,950, and they now requested a further £8,733,000, which Paul refused. The dispute resulted in the claim being arbitrated in the court, and the arbitrators requested the independent valuation of the work completed. In May, Gawler was replaced by George Gray, who accused Gawler of acting like 
under no authority whatsoever. Gawler denied responsibility for the work and blamed Kingston. Kingston himself claimed the work was authorised by the Border Works, who denied even inspecting the site evidence. They did so weakly, as Gawler had kept no documentation whatsoever regarding the contract. It could not be determined who was responsible, and Kingston's appointment was later terminated on the 4th of August, six days after the goal was completed. In early September, the valuation was completed, with the value of the work to be estimated more than £32,000 above the sum already paid which is the court award to borrow and gooder. On the 5th of November the builder submitted a claim for £32,000 plus interest, commission, legal costs, arbitration fees and more than 4000 So in 2011 it was 9666000 Gee, look at that number. It's 9666000. Do you think they could fit any 9s or 6s in that? Okay, Gray refused and threatened to uh, put the case before the British government. In February 1842, Gray commissioned another valuation that presented a revised valuation of £19,650. Today, 2011, it was £5,276,000. Based solely on the original plans, which was offered to the builders, it was initially declined but accepted following pressure from the Bank of South Australia, with whom Borrow and Gooder had a £11,000 overdraft. And by the end of the 1842, both colony newspapers had been taken up the cause in favour of the builders and the memorial was presented to the Secretary of the Colonies in Brisbane, Britain, demanding that arbitra arbitration decision be honoured and put before, a, or put before a trial jury. The sum was reluctantly paid, although the actual construction costs still resulted in the builders declaring bankruptcy. Alright. This is a tower. Beautiful stonework. This is Adelaide in the mid eighteen hundreds. So I just want to say thank you to um, everyone who's been great support recently, and um, I'm still I've got some other information to um, bring out to the light. So I'm just gonna quickly go through a few photos, and that'll be it. It's getting a bit long. Sorry, I can't do it like a slow show. I'll put all the links up in the description, and um, for all you people that have subbed and watched this long. Thank you very much. And to my friends that are watching, I appreciate it. Also, I'm going to look into um, submarines as well. So, Jules Verne and the technology and how did he know about it back then at that day. So, also, this is the Freemason Hall. Um, one architect, young bloke, built. Now it's a mudflat building. They admit that there's another level down below here, and then there's one below that. They admit that. It's written on paper. So, as it approaches, I don't believe that date. The 100th anniversary, step inside the hallow halls of the Grand Lodge of the Freemasons in Adelaide. The lodge is five stories of our ornate architecture in a style that is known as an interior wall free classical style heritage architect Bruce Harry Toll. ABC Adelaide Sonia Philhart. It is a style that is unrelated to Freemasonry that evolved after World War One. It's a style no doubt controversial in its day. The architects did away with the traditional style of the British Freemasonry and moved towards American New World design. It's an eccentric style, which was popular during the 1920s. I'll put links in the descriptions if anyone's interested. And i um, been looking into the secret societies. I'm currently reading a book from the 1500s about it. <coughs> um, the building contained at least three ancient orders of architecture, Dorian, 
iconic and Corinthian. Doric columns, columns can be seen on the ground floor in the Hall of Fame with iconic columns used in the upper level. They have an elbow allegorical meanings with Freemasonry, but they are not specific architectural form for that craft Lodge needs to take, he said. Freemasonry is an international men's group which believed to have been established in the late 14th century. The closed-door groups were established to provide networking opportunities for local men and support communities. Members must profess a belief to a deity which represents by a large G in the centre of each room. The G stands for the Great Architect, represents God, deities of the law religions, and deities of the religions. The Grand Lodge of Freemasons Adelaide Building was entered into the South Australian Heritage Register in 1984. Now, to go into any register, the buildings have to be 100 years old. So, I think the date's more around 1894 that this was built. Uh, looking at the young fellow that done it, the times and supposedly built in the 1920s, well, he didn't live much longer than 1920. Freemasonry is made up of several lodges or sub branches. Each lodge generally meets on a monthly basis. The building's three lodge rooms are laid out in the east west format. The head of the lodge, the worshipful master, is always seated at the center of the eastern row. The lower two floors of the building contain office, meeting rooms with the ground hall on the ground, and then a second large room in the basement. Large rooms and their layout are derived from the stone mason's lodges on the grand cathedral sites in the most medieval and renaissance eras, he said. The original building was going to be faced and lined with a lot of ash of stone cladding, but because of the cost and time, a lot of that had to be cut out. So I think they've just re-renovated it and claimed it, basically. Stone masonry features on the ground of the second floor with wood, cement, plaster, and paint used for other floors to reduce cost. Timber elements within the lodge rooms are secondary to the middle building's design, but have specific um, allegorical roles in the terms of the practices that they take, Mr. Harry said. <laughs> The lodge room is on the top floor of the building and seat up to 600 members. It's no important than any other lodges, simply scaled up to fit larger meetings. The building's architect, John Quinton Bruce, also designed other notable buildings at Adelaide, including the Carl Corps, the Woodward Institute, and the Lecture House buildings. Among the treasures within the building, and one of the most significant to the Freemasonry, is that it contains a 1912 time capsule. Ooh, 1912 time capsule. I would love to see when that's open, and I'd love to be there and see what was written there. I doubt that they would tell the public what was there. Um, okay, it has been found. The contents were discovered in 2015 when a headstone was moved from another site. The Grand Lodge of Freemasonry Adelaide Building and the Adelaide Masonic Group Centre Museum will be open to the public May 7. There you go, okay. Alright, so I'll put that up in the description for you. Just a few um, buildings in Adelaide. They are all pretty much uh, stone. Most of the stone, obviously. Beautiful. A lot of them seem just exquisite. Okay. Now, I just want to quickly show you another thing on, on Google Earth. I went through and found all of churches I could find. I think I think this this is the one this I, I think this is how 
when they arrived in this area, I think this is how all the buildings were. I think they were just a, a standing, free alone shell. And they've come along and gone, oh, look, this is here. All we need is a bit of timber, you know, a bit of slate for the roof, you know, a bit of wiring, you know, a few lamps, street lighting. And, you know, they draw up a plan, make it look out that we built it. But this is what I think is happening. I honestly don't think these buildings were built by these settlers. I honestly don't. And there must have been some sort of device up there that's been removed. This tower is there. So that'll be up in the description. Okay, so just quickly on the Google Earth Pro, I probably left some stuff out. Oh, I know, I know I've left some stuff out, but I've got to stop because this is just going too long at the moment. So let's see if it's saved by little place marks. Yep, okay. Now I'll, I'll try and find some more information out on the tunnels of Adelaide. Now these are all the churches that I just noticed looking at the map, so it took me a fair while to <laughs> go through and do this, so, um, but this is an awful lot. And also I'll look into the other major cities about how many churches are in the cities. I think the churches were either powerhouses or something along that line, sort of fall into the grid pattern of what's been done, so. There's a lot, a lot, and it's even out in the bush, you know, out in the middle of nowhere they've got churches, so I um, don't believe the story of 